so this is the latest in our in our sunset series um as we as we head through the winter and we're now moving to uh, approximately monthly uh, for these sessions and tonight i think it's it, it's doubly exciting i think the the talk tonight which is the the secret life of of Morecambe bay um by yolanda a's uh, who's just started as community engagement officer uh, with the bay program um and doubly exciting i think firstly because th this is actually one of the talks that's by popular request so we've we've done quite a bit um through the sunset series on some of the coastal wildlife the things you can see above the water but we did get a special request which was could we have a talk about what's happening underneath the surface of the water so uh, eventually we've managed to line up yolanda who who uh, works for cumbria wildlife trust um, so that's the first reason that this is exciting. Uh, and the second reason is because Yolanda um, is one of the new recruits to the Bay project, um, subtitled A Blueprint, Blueprint for Recovery. And this is the project that you've probably will have read about um, in the press. There's certainly been lots of coverage about it. And it's a partnership between the Wildlife Trusts in Cumbria and Lancashire um, and the Eden Project North. Uh, and also with the Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust. So it's it's really exciting. And the idea of the programme is to, um, it's really a response to people feeling uh, lonely and, and isolated um, as a, you know, that was exacerbated so much by COVID um, and, and lockdown. And really looking at the, the benefits uh, of nature and better connection with the natural world um, as an antidote, really, for... Um, uh, to prevent people from um, kind of loneliness turning into into something, I guess, a bit more sinister in terms of um, uh, mental health issues, um, and and I think I think it's unique. I think it's the first one of its kind nationally, which is what we call blue social prescribing. So there's there's a few who are looking at the idea of referring uh, basically nature. Uh, or access to nature uh, on the NHS, but it's all been terrestrial. So it's been volunteering in a local park or getting involved with food growing, things like that, um, as a way of reaching wellness. And, and I think this is the first one, which is actually around the value of the sea uh, and how the sea can make us better. And I say the first of its kind, certainly the first of its kind in terms of the modern world, because, of course, a lot of our seaside resorts around Morecambe Bay were built on the premise that going and taking the sea air um, was good for you. And actually, Grange over Sands and Morecambe uh, in particular, they grew up as destinations uh, for that very reason. So there's this lovely kind of way in which the, the the present is learning from the past and just sort of doing it in a slightly different way so it is it's absolutely brilliant um yolanda to uh, that, that you've been able to join us so we can find out a little bit more about the bay but hopefully a little bit about what you're doing on your project too um so i'm not going to do a long preamble today uh i'll just say very briefly just a reminder um that the sunset series um has been a way of us keeping in touch with all of you uh, we say very regularly on these that Morecambe bay partnership it is those of us who volunteer for the partnership. It's those who work for the partnership. But ultimately, it, it's all those of you who support us uh, wherever you live around the Bay or around the world. And this is our way of keeping in touch with you, but also um, of you keeping in touch with each other all through COVID. I think when we started, we had no idea that nearly two years later, we'd still be in some kind of restrictions. And, and actually, this would be an essential part um, of doing what we do best, which is celebrating the Bay conserving it and connecting all of you uh, with 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 this magnificent place so thank you very much all of you for joining us and Yolanda I will hand over to you thank you so the secret life of Morecambe Bay so we've got Morecambe Bay here stretching all the way from Walney Island in the north down to Fleetwood at the south and this covers an area of 195 square miles. And it's got this enormous tidal, this enormous tidal range of about 10 and a half meters. So at extreme low tides, that leaves about 120 square miles of exposed sand. Now, Morecambe Bay is actually the most important intertidal area in Britain. The bird life of Morecambe Bay is very well known and I won't talk too much about this because I know you had to talk about this previously but the bay's sediments as you know will support a huge variety of bird life 
So in the sediments, we've got bivalves, crabs, worms, basically an all-you-can-eat buffet for the wading birds that live in the bay, like the oyster catcher and the curlew. And it might seem hard to believe some days, but lots of, lots of birds migrate to spend the winter in Morecambe Bay because they think it's lovely and warm here, or at least it is compared to Antarctica. So we've got these amazing intertidal zones. And one of the best known species in Morecambe Bay is mussels. So even if you're not particularly knowledgeable about marine life, you'll probably recognize these from the supermarket shelves. There's a long, long history of mussel fisheries in Morecambe Bay. These live on the lower um, intertidal zone and in the subtidal zone. And they sometimes form these fantastic mussel reefs where thousands and thousands of mussels attach themselves to the seabed and to each other by sticky fibers. Now, as well as providing food for humans, mussel reefs provide food for birds and for fish. They're biodiversity hotspots and they hugely increase the species richness of an area meaning that they enable many of the species to come and live and survive in that area. Now, the humble mussel can actually live, in theory, to 24 years, but it faces a constant struggle against being eaten. So here we have what looks like a cute, harmless little snail, the dog whelk. And this is actually a ruthless predator. It uses its mouth to force open the shells of bivalves, like the poor harmless mussel, or to drill a hole into the shell of the mussel. And the dog whelk then produces digestive enzymes, which it secretes into the body of its prey and turns its victim into a kind of soup, which it then drinks. So we've got this evil dog whelk and the mussel sometimes puts up a good fight and uses its sticky fibers to immobilize the dog whelk and cause a slow and painful death to that dog whelk. So you'll probably never look at those in the same way again. Also found around mussel beds, we have the common starfish, which is similarly dark once you get to know a bit more about it. So, the common starfish lives on the lower intertidal shore and in the subtidal zone. And it also enjoys snacking on mussels. Now, the underneath of the starfish is actually covered in these tiny, tiny little tube feet. And these are used to enable the starfish to walk. Starfish can actually reach speeds of a not very impressive 18 meters per hour, but these little legs have a darker function. They've got tiny little suction cups attached to the end, and they use these to attach onto the shells of animals like mussels and slowly, slowly, slowly prise them apart. And then the starfish turns its stomach inside out through its mouth, through that little hole there, and the inside out stomach enters the shell of its victim. And again, it secretes these enzymes into the victim to digest it. We also find various crab species hanging around trying to eat mussels. So we've got the shore crab and the shore crab means that mussels sometimes meet death by crushing with these pincers. And here we've got the edible crab, which can grow to up to 20 centimeters. And the edible crab eats things like mussels and even smaller crabs. And this slightly evil looking animal is the velvet swimming crab. And you can see it's got these red eyes and that along with the fact that even by the standards of crabs, it's quite an aggressive animal has led to this crab being given the nickname of the red-eyed devil. 
Now, here we have one of my favorite animals, the hermit crab. And these actually have quite soft and delicate bodies. So they live in empty snail shells. And as they grow, hermit crabs move into larger and larger shells. Now, hermit crabs are actually quite picky when it comes to which shell they want to live in. So they choose carefully and they're able to remember which shell they've already looked at and rejected. Now, hermit crabs live in groups, but just because they live in groups doesn't mean they actually like the crabs that they live with. They're pretty mean to each other a lot of the time. Each group of hermit crabs has got a dominant male and he's the boss. And that is basically the individual that wins the most fights. So the dominant male hermit crab will show off basically and show that he's the boss by doing mean things like taking resources from the other hermit crabs. So for example, hermit crabs will occasionally try to steal each other's shells by forcibly evicting the current owner. So if a hermit crab decides that he likes the look of another hermit crab shell, he'll go up to his opponent and start knocking on the shell to force the opponent out. And then they have a hermit crab fight until there's a winner. It gets worse with the hermit crabs. They're mostly scavengers, but if they're getting really hungry and food is running really low, they will start eating each other. Um, despite all these depressing, gloomy, yet slightly intriguing facts about hermit crabs, they are really, really important in an ecosystem. So they do occasionally eat each other, but most of the time they're scavengers and detritivores. And so they're really important in that they help to decompose dead materials and that helps to cycle nutrients. Now, we've talked about mussel reefs. Here we have a different kind of reef called the honeycomb worm reef. And these are built by this worm. Now, you're quite likely to have seen honey honeycomb worm reefs, but you'll almost never see the worm that builds them. And that's because they're hiding inside the reef. Each worm builds itself a little tube made of sand and shell fragments, and then glues it together with mucus, lovely. And the tube is like a little worm apartment. So a reef can basically be thought of as a worm city consisting of thousands or even millions of worms. The honeycomb worm feeds from their tubes. They don't leave their little tube apartment. They just put their tentacles out into the water and catch, and catch food that floats by. Now, honeycomb worms build their reef, their reef on rocky substrate in the intertidal zones of Morecambe Bay. And these honeycomb worm reefs are actually really important ecologically and can transform the physical environment because they stabilize sediment that would otherwise be floating around and moving around a lot. So the honeycomb worm is classed as an ecosystem engineer, meaning that it's, it has a really significant impact on its habitat. Honeycomb worm reefs are associated with a high diversity of fauna. So for example, as part of our rock pools and sharks event on Saturday that we held, we looked around some honeycomb reefs and we found this called the elegant anemone living around a honeycomb reef. Another kind of worm that's got the same sort of idea as the honeycomb worm is the sand mason worm. And this also lives in intertidal and subtidal habitats. Now it can grow to about this length, about 30 centimeters, but it's very rarely seen because again, it lives in a tube that's made out of grains of sand and little bits of shell. And we just see the end of it poking out of the sand and the sand mason uses this crown of tentacles that you can see to catch little passing particles of food.
In the bay, we also have the common cockle, and this lives on muddy and sandy shores in the intertidal zone. And this is a really, really important food source for birds and is also collected by humans. Now, you might well have noticed these peculiar holes that we find in rocks on the shore. And they look like they should be man-made, but they're actually made by pinnocks. And these are a bivalve that actually bore their way into rocks. And they stay in the same place their whole lives. And when they grow, they just make their burrow a little bit bigger so that they have more room. And as a weird fact about the common piddock, it can actually glow in the dark. Through bioluminescence, it glows a sort of blue-green around the edges. And the protein that creates this glow has been extracted from the common piddock and used to help identify when people are getting ill because it gives off light when it encounters chemicals produced by white blood, felt, by white blood cells that fight infections. So this can help doctors to prescribe treatments faster and fight infections before they even really take hold. Now, no rock pooling trip is really complete without having seen this lovely beadlet anemone. And these are usually spotted as a sort of blob in a rock pool. But when the tide comes in, their tentacles become visible because they're not scared about drying out when they're underwater and they're looking for food. They use these tentacles to grab any unlucky prey that might be passing, like shrimps or even crabs and small, and small fish. And believe it or not, the beetle anemone is also very territorial. So if you can see on that picture, We've got this lovely ring of, of bright blue little beads. They're actually packed full of stinging cells. So if another anemone gets too close, then the anemone will fight off its opponent to defend its patch. Now, it's a bit weird when anemones have babies. They can reproduce by making a clone but they can also reproduce sexually. And in this case, up to a hundred little baby anemones are grown inside the female before being released out into the water to swim off. We found a few of these around the, um, the intertidal zone at the weekend. And this is the common blenny or the, or the shanny. And as you can see in this picture, it's actually outside of the water and yet it's doing pretty fine. So the common blenny can survive outside of the water for quite long periods of time because it's able to retain water in the gill cavity. You can see it's got quite a strong, powerful jaw to crush food like barnacles and crabs. And it is actually quite a feisty little fish. So it has been known to snap at fingers if you pick it out of a rock pool. Now with the blenny, it's actually the male, the dad, that guards the little baby eggs. And male blennies are actually generally very good fathers and they'll defend their eggs against hungry predators. Um, although having said that, there have been a few cases of blenny dads eating their own eggs if they get hungry enough. And as a mysterious fact about the blenny, it seems to be able to find its way back to its home if it's captured and released. And nobody's quite sure how, but it has an excellent sense of direction. And in amongst all of these murderous cannibalistic animals, we do have some lovely peace-loving seaweed eating snails like the edible periwinkle and the flat periwinkle who just spend their days grazing on seaweed instead of eating their kids. Now, if we go a bit deeper into Morecambe Bay, we come to the subtidal areas 
the areas that are always underwater. Subtidal sand and mud are really, really important habitats in Morecambe Bay. And one of the most peculiar animals that we find in the subtidal zone are brittle stars. Now, to my mind, brittle stars look like they should be out of the Jurassic period. And in a way they are. They've actually inhabited the oceans for about 480 million years which makes them twice as old as the first dinosaurs. Now, brittle stars are related to starfish and they do occasionally get eaten by their relative, the common starfish. But brittle stars have an amazing superpower. If they're being attacked by a predator, they can actually lose the arm that's being attacked and just grow a new one. Other species that we get in the subtidal zone include uh, bryozoa, and these are little microscopic aquatic invertebrates, and they live in colonies. So here we have hornwrack. It's often mistaken for a seaweed, but if you look really, really closely, it's actually made up of hundreds of tiny little animals. And occasionally, you'd find one of these bizarre looking animals. This is the sea potato, which is a sea urchin that lives in a burrow in the sand. Subtidal sand is also a really important nursery ground for fish, such as place. Females can produce up to half a million eggs, which is just as well because almost none of them survive to adulthood. So the eggs are laid in shallow water, which makes Morecambe Bay a really good habitat. And place, if they can get through the really dangerous early childhood part of their lives, can live for up to 50 years. Now, place have got both their eyes on the top of their head, but actually when they're, um, at about six weeks old, place undergo a transformation. They start off with one eye on either side and at about six weeks, one of the eyes moves around to the other side of the head. Another really important habitat in Morecambe Bay is seagrass. So as well as providing a food source for wintering wildfowl and nursery and spawning ground for small fish and for crustaceans, seagrass beds are a really good organic carbon store. So seagrass meadows can actually capture carbon from the atmosphere up to 35 times faster than tropical rainforests. And we do have seagrass around Walney. Um, and this is thought to be the only place where seagrass is found around northwest England. And actually, the Marine Futures interns are mapping seagrass at the moment as part of their project. And we have salt marshes. And these are areas of wetland that are flooded and drained by the tide. And they're also found around Morecambe Bay. So we get salt marsh habitat around the major estuaries that feed into Morecambe Bay. So that's the Leven, the Kent, Wyre and the Loom. And we also get salt marshes along the northern side of Walney Island. So salt marshes are really important because loads and loads and loads of invertebrates live there. And of course, invertebrates provide food for many, many species that depend on the bay. Now, at the other end of the scale to invertebrates, we do have these rather adorable creatures, the gray seal. The Latin name for the gray seal means hook-nosed sea pig, which you can sort of see with the shape of the face. Seals grow to two and a half meters and can weigh up to 300 kilograms. And seals, they're a funny animal. They're actually quite new in evolutionary terms. 
they evolved from land mammals about 23 million years ago. So their closest living land relatives are actually thought to be bears. Now, seals are of course mammals, just like us. And like most mammals, they invest a lot of energy into looking after their young. So here we have an adorable little, cutesy little gray seal. Um, and one of the defining characteristics of mammals is that they provide milk for their young. And apart from providing milk, mammals will often shelter and care for their young for long periods of time, often around 30 years in the case of humans. So with grey seals, one pup is born at a time. And when the baby seal, the pup is born, it's a mere 15 kilograms. And they're born with this adorable fluffy coat. Now, a really strong bond forms between the mum and her pup, which isn't surprising. I mean, you know, look at that little seal face and those big eyes, you'd fall in love. And the mum can actually recognise her baby from its smell and also from its call. So pups will suckle from their mum about six times a day. And because the milk is 60% fat, the pup puts on about two kilograms every day. Meanwhile, poor old mum loses about a quarter of her body weight by the time the pup is weaned. So mummy seal looks after baby seal for about three weeks. And at that point, the mother decides she's had enough and mates with one of the bull seals and then swims away, leaving the poor little pup to fend for itself. Now, interestingly, the fertilized egg will remain in the mother and will remain dormant for about three and a half months before implanting into the wall of the uterus and starting to develop. And the reason for this is that the mum's just had a baby. She's just been feeding the baby for weeks. It's been hard work and she needs to get her strength back and put on some more weight before she's ready to be pregnant again. So the abandoned pup then stays on the land for three or four weeks, living off its blubber reserves, wondering where mum has gone and getting very hungry until its lovely little fluffy fur has been replaced by this waterproof coat. And at this point, the baby seal leaves the shore and heads out into the wide, wide ocean looking for its first proper meal. So to start off with, the seal pup will feed on small animals like shrimp, but gradually learns how to catch bigger and bigger animals like sand eels, cod, but then it can't afford to be too fussy because the seal needs to eat five kilograms of food every single day. Now, the grey seal is actually a success story in terms of conservation. Historically, they were hunted a lot in the UK for meat, oil and fur. And by the early 20th century, numbers of grey seal in the UK had hugely dropped off. And there were only about 500 individuals. Grey seals were actually the first mammals to be protected by modern legislation under the Grey Seals Protection Act of 1914. And today there are over 120,000 grey seals in Britain, making up about 40% of the world's grey seal population. More grey seals are now being born than ever before on British coastlines. And I am delighted to say that one of the places that they're born is actually on South Walney Nature Reserve. Now, grey seals have been monitored on South Walney since the 1980s and have been monitored quite closely since the early 2000s. And what used to be just a couple of sightings every year has now turned into an established colony of seals. It used to be that South Walney was just somewhere that the seals would come to relax and to molt. But in 2015, we had our first newborn seal pup on Walney Island, and numbers are now growing year on year. Now, 
pups have only got three weeks to get milk from their mum before she leaves them. So the last thing they need is to be disturbed by humans. And for that reason, there's no public access to the beaches on South Walney. Um, but we do actually have a live seal crack camera enabling you to see the seals anytime you like. It is slightly addictive though. It's a good idea to set a timer before you start watching the seals or you might find that you've lost a couple of hours of your life. Now, we also occasionally get this marine mammal around Morecambe Bay. And this is the harbour porpoise, sometimes seen particularly around Fleetwood. Porpoises belong to a group of animals called cetaceans, consisting of whales, dolphins and porpoises. And like seals, cetaceans are also descended from land mammals. So in the case of cetaceans, their closest living land relative is actually a hippo. Now, the bay is too shallow for a lot of cetacean species. So, for example, the blue whale is the biggest animal that's ever lived. It can reach about 30 metres and it's not going to get on well in Morgan Bay. It's going to get grounded pretty fast. But the harbour porpoise actually likes living in shallow water. Now, as is the case with all cetaceans, the harbour porpoise finds its way around by using echolocation. It makes clicking noises, it sends out these clicks, and by listening to the echo, it can work out what its surroundings are and where to find its food. So as porpoises are mammals, they nurse their young. Porpoises do put a bit more time and effort into looking after their young than seals. Porpoises feed their young for about eight months instead of giving up after three weeks. And like seals, the harbour porpoise has a big appetite. It eats about 10% of its body weight every day. It mostly eats things like sand eels. Now, the harbour porpoise is quite a shy animal. It's not like dolphins that will often come up to boats. It tends to head away as soon as it sees a boat. But it can be seen on quite calm, flat days. And you might also hear it because it makes a little puffing noise when it comes out of the water and breathes out, which is how it got its nickname of the puffing pig, which is quite cute. All right, now, this isn't quite so cute, but these animals are amazing. We do actually get sharks around the bay. Now, unlike seals and cetaceans, which both appeared quite recently. Sharks have been around for about 450 million years. So they're almost as old as brittle stars and a lot older than the dinosaurs. Now, a lot of people think of tropical seas and jaws when they think of sharks, but there are actually over 40 shark species found in the waters around the UK. And they're usually only too keen to, to stay away from humans. Now, you might be pleased or you might be disappointed to hear that you're very unlikely to encounter a shark on the beach, but you are likely to come across evidence of them in the form of egg cases, also known as mermaid's purses. Eggs are laid by some sharks and all true skates. So skates are a kind of fish that are very closely re related to sharks. So we've got this egg case, which is a sort of tough leathery capsule. And inside we've got a little, little baby shark, a little shark pup. Now sharks and skate, unlike mammals, they don't put any effort at all really into raising their young. Mummy shark just lays the eggs and is long gone by the time the little baby shark hatches. Now, egg cases can often wash up on the beaches. And by looking at the size and the shape of the egg cases, we can actually identify the species of shark that laid it. So to give you an idea of the numbers, we had a rock pools and sharks day on Saturday at Walney Island. 
We spent about three hours looking for egg cases. The average age of the participants was probably about 10. And we found 304 egg cases. So on this slide, we have some of Saturday's finds. So by far the most common egg case was this, which belongs to the small spotted cat shark. I think we got something like 295 of these. And as you can see, the egg cases have these sort of long curly tendrils at each end. And mummy shark does do a tiny bit of, of looking after the babies. She uses the curly tendrils to tie the egg cases to seaweeds. And that's about the one bit of parenting she does before she swims off and leaves the little baby shark in its little egg case. So we've got the small spotted cat shark. And I think this species is actually quite cute. I know it doesn't have the sort of big eyes that the gray seal does. Um, but as a cute little fact about the species, when it feels threatened, it will actually curl up into a donut shape. So it'll curl up into a little ball, which has led to some people giving them the nickname of shy sharks. We also found these egg cases from this species, the thornback gray. And we found this egg case from the spotted ray. Now, confusingly, um, the thornback ray and the spotted ray are not actually rays at all. They're actually um, skates. Um, and one of the key differences between skates and rays is that rays don't lay eggs. So that's biology, it's just a confusing name there. But yes, we had these two and then the find of the day I wish I could say that I'd found these, this one, but it was actually found by a boy who I think was about eight, um, but I got to take it home. Um, this one is from a nurse hound. So it's about this big. It was a fantastic find, really pleased with that. So we have sharks in Morecambe Bay and various other fish. So we have the flounder, dab, sea bass and salmon, to name a few. Now, like pretty much everywhere, Morecambe Bay is facing a number of conservation challenges. And one challenge that is pretty much universal to marine areas is the problem of marine litter. Particularly plastic pollution. About 380 million tonnes of plastic is produced each year. So to put that in perspective, that's more than the total weight of the human population. And it's estimated that roughly half of the plastic produced is actually single use only. Plastics often end up in the ocean. And from there, animals can become tangled up in them. Um, or they can actually eat the plastics. And if they've got a stomach full of plastic, they feel quite full. So it stops them from going and searching for proper food and they can starve. Now, a lesser known form of plastic pollution is actually nurdles. And nurdles are tiny little plastic balls. I've got some here actually, don't know if you can see. Um, and these are used to make plastic products. So nurdles are transported across the world in their billions and they get spilled at every stage of the industrial process. So millions of these wash up on UK beaches every year. So here we have some nurdles and some fish eggs. And you can imagine that if you were a hungry fish swimming along in a murky sea, it could be quite hard to tell the difference. Nurdles are often eaten by seabirds, fish, um, and various other marine animals. Now, fishing provides a vital food source for many, many people. 
um, particularly in light of the fact that we've got a growing world population that we need to feed. Um, and of course it provides livelihoods. Um, sometimes fishing is done in a way that doesn't harm wildlife and sometimes it is done in a way that can be enormously harmful to wildlife. So for example, the harbour porpoise is notorious for getting tangled up in fishing nets. And then of course, it can't swim to the surface, so it drowns. Also, if fish stocks are being depleted faster than they can regenerate, basically if we're taking more fish out of the oceans than are being replaced, then the numbers are inevitably going to decline. So this is bad for us and bad for all the other species that depend on the stocks. And of course, climate change will impact Morecambe Bay. So the global ocean has warmed faster over the past century than it has since the end of the last deglacial transition about 11,000 years ago. And oceans are going to continue to get warmer. So this is going to affect the species found in the bay and the distribution. Sea level rise is also going to lead to intertidal habitats being lost. Now, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which leads to global warming, is actually, a lot of it is absorbed by the oceans. Now, this might sound like a really good thing because it's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but actually um, carbon dioxide being absorbed by the oceans makes the oceans more acidic. And this is particularly bad news for animals like mussels, which have shells, because increased acidification makes it harder to build and maintain a shell. And of course, the different species and an ecosystem are all interconnected. So a change in the fortunes of one species could impact many, many other species and that will in turn impact more species still. But it's not all bad news. So beach cleans and nurdle hunts reduce the amount of litter and debris in the oceans. It is, of course, much more effective to stop plastics from entering the oceans in the first place. And we can do this by reducing the amount of plastic we use, reusing plastic instead of just using it once, and recycling plastic once we've finished with it. And I think people are learning more and more about the environment and how best to protect the oceans. Um, one of the best ways to protect animals around the bay, as counterintuitive as this may seem, is just to stay out of their way. So for example, with the grey seal pups, as tempting as it is to chase after them and cuddle them and kiss them and take one home as a pet, the best thing we can do for them really is just to watch them on the webcam or to watch them from the hide rather than going on the beaches where the mums are trying to raise their pups. Sustainable fishing is vital to protecting the marine ecosystem. So by fishing at levels at which the population can replace itself, we ensure that the resource is protected. So both for our own future use and also for the sake of the ecosystem and all the other species that depend on it. It's also important to make sure that the fishing methods don't harm habitats and don't catch non-target species by catch. For example, catching sea bass um, using pole and line fishing is a much more environmentally friendly way than using gill nets. So with pole and line fishing, um, there are far lower levels of bycatch. And when the wrong species is accidentally caught, its chance of survival is very high if it's thrown back. With gill nets, they trap pretty much everything. And by the time it's thrown back into the water, it's probably dead anyway. Now, regarding climate change, 
There are efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which may or may not work out. We'll see, see how it goes. Um, what we can also do, though, is by reducing other pressures on species. So by reducing um, unsustainable fishing, this can actually help wildlife adapt to climate change. So by reducing or eliminating the other pressures, we make it more likely that species will be able to cope with climate change. And marine habitats such as seagrass and salt marshes, as I mentioned earlier, can actually capture and hold huge amounts of carbon, thereby reducing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, one way to protect areas is to designate them as marine protected areas. And marine protected areas, or MPAs, are places at sea where environmentally damaging activities, such as certain types of fishing, are restricted. There are various different kinds of marine protected area, and one of the main ones is a marine conservation zone. And I'm pleased to say that there is one within Morecambe Bay. It's the Wyaloon Marine Conservation Zone. It was designated in 2019 in the south of the bay. And it was designated because of this species here, the smelt, also known as the cucumber fish sometimes because apparently they smell of cucumber. So smelt were once widespread in estuaries and their numbers have declined significantly over the last couple of hundred years. So it's hoped that by protecting estuaries, such as the loon and wire, it will help these numbers to recover. Now, this might sound obvious, but marine protected areas only actually work um, if they are protected in real life. Um, now, that should go without saying, but all too often marine protected areas are what is sometimes called paper parks, and they're protected in name only. So for a marine protected area to actually be effective, it needs to be big enough. So there's no point in having a marine protected area that's the size of my kitchen. It needs to be a decent size. They need to be close together and include various different kinds of habitat and be representative. We need to have enough of them and they actually do need to be actively protected. We need to make sure that harmful activities are not taking place in them. Now, I hope that wasn't too much doom and gloom between the murderous crabs and the cannibal blennies and the plastic pollution. Um, I'm actually feeling really op optimistic, believe it or not, about the future of Morecambe Bay. Um, the Bay Project, which I work for, is a new project that's aiming to get people involved in nature and involved in their community. And it's early days, but we've had a really great response so far. People came out in the wind and the rain to hunt for egg cases. And we submitted the data to the Shark Trust who were amazed that we found 300 egg cases and very pleased with us. So um, I think people are increasingly um, aware of the importance of the natural environment, particularly post COVID, and are increasingly keen to make sure that we protect this fantastic area for ourselves and for the species that live there and also for generations to come. Thank you very much, Yolanda. That was that was brilliant. Um, again, you, you're you're keeping up the, uh, the sort of the reputation of these of having very very good images. Oh, so good! Some, I didn't want to be one to. <laughs> brilliant photos. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so you got a few people. Uh, we've got some little applauses and thumbs up and things happening on the screen. But um, thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, please post your questions uh, for Yolanda in the chat about anything um, that, that you've heard. Um, and uh, I've got a couple up my sleeve. Uh, I'm, I'm a massive fan of uh, 
of, of um, marine wildlife. So I've got a few for you, y- Yolanda. But um, the more questions you have, the less um, that I speak, which is better for everybody, I think. It's certainly better for my for my throat. Um, okay, so a couple of questions here already. So uh, I'll start, Michelle, with your question because you were the first one in. Um, so Morecambe Bay Partnership had the, the Catching Tales uh, oral history project a few years ago. Um, where we collected stories from the local fishing community. Uh, and Michelle, uh, you're right that you remember one lady talking about catching tope. Um, so Yolanda, what, what is a tope? Is it a type of shark? You're on mute. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry. I wish I could give a proper answer to that one, but I'm not actually sure on that one. Um, I mostly worked with the rocky shores in my previous role and cetaceans and tope comes under the list of things that I sort of mugged up on in the last six weeks since starting this job. So I'm sorry, I wish I could help you with that one. I think Dr. Google might be the answer and I'll Google it after this. I I think it is a shark, tope, because I have heard it before, but I'm not entirely sure um, exactly which sort it is. You you mentioned the nurse hound earlier on, didn't you, that you'd found the egg case of. I have a feeling that it is it is linked to the nurse hound. It might even be another name for it, but I I don't know. I'm right on the edge of my knowledge. Um, So if anyone knows, um, then oh, here we go. Morgan Bay Partnership. Thank you very much. Um, There's a long answer there anyway. So it's a hound. So it is a hound shark uh, of the family Triacidae. Um, Common names are taupe shark, snapper shark, superfin shark. Um, and it's found worldwide in temperate seas and can grow to nearly two metres long. So there you go, Michelle. Thank you. Um, now, this is a good question. Um, huh. Whether, whether again, you'll be able to answer it, Yolanda, I'm not sure. Why isn't the whole of the, why isn't the whole of the Bay Area protected? So you mentioned the Marine Conservation Zone earlier on for mm. Loon and Wire. Um, Actually, that is not the only protected area within Morecambe Bay. So um, Morecambe Bay is also a special area of conservation. Um, And so that aims to protect habitats and species that are of European importance. Um, So that's another MPA, Marine Protected Area within the Bay. Um, And Morecambe Bay um, is also a special protection area on account of its bird life. So it's not just the marine conservation zone that's a protected area. Um, that's a good question, really. Um, can I, can, can uh, I come in? Well, yeah, please. Um, so, so one of the things that's going on at the moment is the government has a, a consultation, um, which is around what are called highly protected marine areas. And highly protected marine areas uh, are almost like they're, they're supposed to be the next level up from marine conservation zone. So Yolanda hinted earlier on that um, marine. the problem with marine conservation zones is they're not really policed. So though in theory they're stopping um, commercial fishing, in reality, uh, that they, they're not that effective. So the idea, idea of highly protected marine areas is that they would effectively they would be policed and they would actually stop all forms of fishing, including recreational fishing and, uh, and, and angling, leisure fishing. Um, so, so I think that the, the first round of highly protected marine areas are uh, trying to avoid places where recreational angling is, um, is popular. And that does include, obviously, a lot of the shores around Morecambe Bay. So the, the one that we have... Uh, which is not going to be put forward in the first list of highly protected marine areas, but might come um, later on. It's called the Loon Deep. So you mentioned earlier on the Wire and Loon Estuary, effectively, which is the marine conservation zone for smelt. There's a really amazing kind of deep sea canyon uh, that's the next bit out. And I think we are hopeful that we might get some protection for the Loon Deep, Um, but it will need, um, there's two problems with the Loon Deep. One of them is recreational fishing. The other one is is that there's um, munitions that were dumped um, into the trench, which apparently causes problems as well. But um, at some point in the future, I think both the wildlife trusts 
um, and the Northwest Living Seas, but also Morecambe Bay Partnership. I can see us getting behind a bit of a campaign um, to get the Loon Deep designated as a highly protected marine area. So it's quite could be quite exciting times once the first trial lot uh, have gone uh, have gone through. The there are four in the Irish Sea though that are, are being put forward, but they're they're all quite a long way out, uh, and they're not very Morecambe Bay. I think the closest one is called called Mud Hole. Um, which is basically off the Whitehaven and St. Bees bit of the coastline, uh, which is a, a big, deep, muddy hole that's basically got langoustine in it or Dublin Bay prawns. Uh, it's a fishery for those. There's another point actually about um, marine protected areas. One way of thinking of them is um, basically like a control. So in a science experiment, um, you would have the experiment you were doing, and then you would have the experiment where you are changing nothing. Um, so let's say that you are seeing what the effect was of feeding prawns nurdles. You would have prawns that you were feeding nurdles to, and you would have prawns that you were feeding um, that you weren't feeding nurdles to. Um, so by having the marine protected areas, it basically allows us to see what the ocean would be like if we weren't doing anything to it. And that also helps us to work out, you know, what effects we're actually having on the marine environment. Um, so that would be another reason why it would be fantastic to get more marine protected areas. Yeah. Um, of course, like we need to make sure we're not, we need to be mindful of people's livelihoods, um, but then marine protected areas, if managed properly, can actually increase um, fish stocks, for example. Yeah. So it, it helps in the long run. Yeah. I did post a, um, a link actually in the chat to the Cumbria Creel project, um, which is another um, Northwest Living Seas led project, which was looking at the potential to basically reinstate traditional fishing practices with creels, um, which is again for, for langoustine in particular, um, which is, is linked to what you're saying, Yolanda, which is, um, is a really nice one because it both ties into the heritage of the bay, but also is a way of promoting um, sort of preservation of the seabed and uh, more sustainable fishing methods. So that is a really interesting project if anybody wants to look at that, that link. Um, Mike Hinson uh, asks, uh, how many grey seals are there in the bay and how many pups each year are born, roughly? Ooh. I think... 500 is the figure that springs to mind, but I can't remember where I actually read that one. So I'm not completely sure, but I think it's in that kind of region. Yeah. Um, pups per year. Um, I'm not sure on the exact figure. I know we're on three pups so far this year, um, but it's early days so far. So I'm hoping we're going to have many more. So when does the um, pupping season end then? When does it run to? Um, it about January, season? I think, would okay. be the end. Yeah. But it does it does vary a bit. Yeah. Um, and, you I mean, you, you, you put up that, that wonderful slide showing how the numbers uh, on South Walney have gone up and up and up over the decades. So g given that, um, you know, we do hear a lot about the problems that wildlife is facing. But why, why are the grey seals such a success story for Morecambe Bay? Um, I think partly legislation, that means that they're largely being protected, um, is helpful. Also, um, once the colonies got established, the seals, if they know that Walney Island is a safe place to have their pups, will tend to come back year after year. So once once it's got started it builds basically yeah. um there has been we have got a drone now which we use to check up on the seals so part of the increase in numbers might be due to having the drone to spy on them um but it that's only part of it and it is also a genuine increase in the seal numbers yeah. that's good it's really really good to see okay um i'll uh, I'm, I'm going to have to start scanning backwards and forwards through these, but um, I can't resist a question from a, from a six-year-old. So uh, thank you very much, Ada, and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you didn't mention jellyfish, and Ada's seen them. So why did you not mention jellyfish? Because um, I only had 40 minutes was part of it. Um, 
jellyfish, they are kind of interesting. They're one of the oldest animals um, on Earth, actually. Um, and they're one that is actually thought might do quite well um, in terms of ocean degradation. So warmer, acidic oceans is kind of what jellyfish like. So that's one species that you don't really need to worry about too much, really. Whether that's a good or bad thing is, uh, is debatable. And, um, I mean, can you just maybe give us the names of one or two species of jellyfish that we might we might see, either washed up on the beaches or out on a boat trip? Ooh, I'm sorry, I don't know my jellyfish very well. Not well enough to give you a name of, of the species you get in Morgan Bay. I'll have to... I'll, I'll have to see if I can dig out a, a link because I think there is something on the on the Living Seas uh, website. Um, if anyone is a member of Lancashire Wildlife Trust, actually, the last uh, edition we had a guide to jellyfish um, in that, so in the summer edition uh, of our of our magazine. So I'll have to see if I can dig it out in a minute when I stop asking you questions. Um, good, thank you. Uh, so there's a question here about um, eco moorings. Um, so Vicky asks, um, are there any plans to install eco moorings for boats around the seagrass beds to protect the habitat there, please? So you obviously mentioned the ones, uh, around Barrow and Woolney, um, and there are some at Studley Bay. Um, not that I know of, but I've been in the post six weeks, so... There may be that I don't know of. I'm sorry, I can't give a more, more definite answer there on that one. I think there is definitely a project going on. You mentioned the interns before, didn't you? The living Yeah, so we were doing some, um, some mapping um, with the marine interns of that region. Yeah. And I, I have... can uh, jump in. Yeah. I know that there's been some discussion with the boat owners around the seagrass beds around at Roe Island to try and get them to um, change how they, well, where they moor their boats away from where the seal egress is there. But I think eco moorings, and I might be completely wrong, but I think they only work in areas where they're always above the, the water. Whereas a lot of the places where boats moor around the edge of Morecambe Bay, they're in that muddy into tidal area some of the time yeah but i'm not sure just done a little bit of googling myself yeah i do know that there is definitely research going on into the, the sort of the impacts if you know what i mean and uh and and uh whether that is a stepping stone to a project to look at eco moorings i'm not sure but there's definitely is some work going on so um thank you um so there's a a, a link here um that uh, michelle's posted to um to a few different species of jellyfish the moon jellyfish is the famous one isn't it that washes up which has got the whole the blue or purple sort of four horseshoes on its dish that's about the same size as a i don't know side plate or a dinner plate um but there are some more species that are mentioned on there as well there's the mauve mauve stinger and the blue jellyfish and things like that so um you know please have a look at the link ada um, they're very beautiful as well, aren't they, jellyfish? They're absolutely spectacular. Um, I have to admit, I kind of think they're they're more beautiful than seals are, Yolanda. I'm sorry. Oh, they're gorgeous <laughs> colours and shapes. Um, so, uh, so we've got lots of um, lots of thanks coming in. People saying things like they can't believe that you've only been here um, for six weeks, given your good good knowledge about the. Um, about all this amazing wildlife so 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 thank you and very brave as well to be put on the spot so soon in your role so i think it's a, a very promising start you've made